Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tom Kalaga of the New York Times, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the first ever New York Times Food Festival. Yeah. This is a food festival as big and exciting as the city that inspired it. All this weekend, there's the park, food tastings, live cooking demonstrations, and more, just down the block in Bryant Park. Then there are the nights, seven evenings of exclusive dinners at 10 of New York Times food critic Pete Wells's favorite restaurants. And here in the Times Center, there are the talks, a series of discussions with the most interesting and vital voices in today's film food scene. Following today's talk, we invite you to enjoy a free cup of coffee from Joe in the lobby and visit our festival lounge downstairs in the hall. There you can grab a drink at the festival bar, watch the other talks as they're streamed live, visit the Kitchen Arts and Letters pop-up bookshop for author signings and books by our featured chefs and journalists, and enjoy a free scoop of the flavor of record, the ice cream flavor created by the Times in collaboration with Ample Hills Creamery, and much more. I'd like to give special thanks to the sponsor of the New York Times Food Festival, our presenting sponsor, MasterCard, our major sponsor, Uber Eats, our event sponsors, Diageo, Sub-Zero Wolf, and Cove, our supporting sponsors, AARP New York City, Badia Spices, Deloitte, and Resi, and our contributing sponsors, Joe Coffee Company and REI. And now on to our program. This afternoon's talk intends to illuminate that invisible and essential element of a restaurant, hospitality. As we all know, a warm welcome and a watchful eye in the dining room can either elevate or sabotage whatever the chef is doing in the kitchen. We're fortunate to have three of New York City's most respected restaurateurs here to share their stories. Please join me in welcoming Alexander Smalls, Nicole Ponseca, and Will Gadara to the Times Center stage, along with New York Times op-ed columnist, Frank Bruni. Go get him. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you three for being here. Um, I'm gonna uh, chat with these fine people for about 40 minutes. Uh, in the last 20 minutes, you're gonna have an opportunity to ask questions and you're gonna see microphones set up on each aisle if you just line up behind them if you wanna ask a question. And you can ask a question to any one of these people that you like. And then afterwards, um, Nicole and Alexander are gonna be signing copies of their books downstairs. So please stick around for that or go downstairs and, and check that out. Thank you all again. They're trying to get here. your attention to take Ooh. a picture real quick, just right Where now. am I looking? My contacts yeah. are so blurry. <laughs> 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 okay. Um, I wanted to start, we'll get into some, we'll get into the weeds later. I wanted to start with a really general question. So we've all grown up with the age old dictum that the customer is always right. And my guess is you've seen many customers take that a little bit too much to heart. Mm. How would you rewrite that dictum, the customer is always right, to get at what someone really should expect or demand when they walk into a restaurant? Do you wanna go first, Nicole? Wow, you're awesome. Thank you for that question. <laughs> well, in my experience, I'm dealing with uh, a gateway restaurant. And so I'm introducing food to people who've never had it before. I'm reintroducing flavors that people have grown up with. And in my experience, Filipino food is so personal to us. It's been very rare that we've seen it translated in mainstream restaurants. So I get that question or I get that comment, you know, this doesn't taste like I know it. And I can translate that to a critique of whether they like it or not. But I have to maintain that with 7,107 islands, there's 7,107 adobos, or pancits, or sinigang. <laughs> so when I have this conversation with my guests, it, it doesn't become who's right or who's wrong or whose uh, rendition of a dish is better. It becomes a dialogue about the culture, um, the cucineras, and um, the cuisine. Alexander? Well, I think the customer is always right until they're not. <laughs> and 
And it's my job not necessarily to tell them that they're wrong, but to show them another way to have an experience, my experience, the experience I'm curating for them. So uh, the best way to deal with a customer is not to be challenging or antagonistic. Usually people want you to understand the experience they're having. When I first introduced my brand of, of Southern food in New York in the early 90s at a place called Cafe Beulah downtown, um, I was creating, uh, you know, fine dining, uh, uh, culinary African-American experience that a lot of people hadn't enjoyed, including um, a lot of African-Americans. So there was always a question of, well, this isn't the way my mother cooks it. This isn't the way I grew up eating it. Because essentially I'd taken classic recipes and sort of turned them upside down, applied contemporary um, cooking techniques and repositioned them. Um, so that conversation had to be had all the time. And um, people are very possessive about what they're used to. So you have to bring them to why this is another interpretation of something that is equally good. And if you can do that, chances are you can meet in the middle and have a positive experience. Well, can I, can I make it a little more specific for you? Can you tell us the story of a customer you had, maybe at 11 Madison Park, maybe at Nomad, wherever, um, who was one of the most difficult <laughs> over the course of an evening to satisfy and what you did that you felt was ingenious, creative, essential in diffusing that ticking bomb? You want a story of my genius. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, but I want it mixed with a story of our obnoxiousness. <laughs> no, I don't, I mean, I think those are two two slightly different things because I think a lot of the time when a customer is may be difficult in the beginning. It's less about who's right and who's wrong, and it's more just about the energy that they walk into the room with. Um, it's something we talk about in our restaurants all the time, this idea that some people come with the most negative energy, and if we allow ourselves to pass judgment on them because of that energy, we might be overlooking like the biggest responsibility we have. Sometimes the people that act like the biggest jerks are the ones that just need the most love in that moment. <laughs> I mean it. Sometimes there's restaurants where you hear servers speaking negatively about their guests in the service station because the, the guest is being rude. And perhaps cool. that guest is the one that just found out they were getting a divorce on their way to the restaurant. And if you have the ability to flip the script and say, hey. How do you do that? How do you flip the script? just by maybe not receiving negative energy in a personal or emotional way and looking at it as this an is feeling very Marianne Williamson. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna start chanting. Miracles. No, Miracles. but I mean it, that is, I mean, listen, it, it should, because <laughs> one of the things we talk about all the time is that hospitality is about relationships, and relationships, whether it's yours and mine, or mine and my wife's, or my dad and mine, or me and the guest, or me and one of the servers, they're all based on the same principles. Um, and so that goes back to being right. If you try to be right in the relationship with your wife, you'll run out of the will and resources to win that marriage. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the same thing in my relationship with the guest, or honestly in their relationship with me. There's the adage that the customer is always right, and then conversely, there's restaurants where the chef thinks they're always right. Mm. Neither of those is correct. Hospitality is a dialogue and hospitality thrives in the gray that exists between those two things. You are all restaurateurs, yep. but that also makes you particularly discerning diners. So to get at this question about what great hospitality is, could each of you tell me about a meal you've had, it could be recent, it could be years ago, in somebody else's establishment that that experience to you was the quintessence of great hospitality? Nicole? I'm going to uh, take a moment and think about that. I, you know, I am most, I am most often impressed with restaurants where I feel an energy. It's not, it's not so much um, did they pass the plate the right way. I remember when I was trying to learn the restaurant industry, I was so consumed with the choreography of hospitality, and then I learned very quickly that it's really to what Will was saying about energy. So for me, 
I, I just want to touch on that briefly. When I train our staff, we talk about the five basic needs of people. We talk about love, shelter, food, water, and clothing. And I know in the restaurant industry, we can only provide four of those. So when you walk in and you feel an energy, let me get you a glass of water. How was your day? Did you just get off work? Did you, you know, to Will's point, what was going on in their life? So my greatest experiences in restaurants when it comes to hospitality is how was I received and what was the connection? It's very rarely about how perfect um, did the water get poured or any of that. How did they respond to me? Um, one restaurant in particular for me is a, uh, it's a seafood restaurant in uh, Queens. It's uh, Elias's Seafood Corner. It's been there for years. I remember the first time I took a bite, it was like a ratatouille moment. Everything stopped. And you know, I don't even think they have, at this time, wine. It wasn't a wine list. It wasn't anything of, of a perfection or a nature of what you have to check off a list. It really is about um, the, human, the human condition. And, and feeling the love, because in New York City in particular, you know, we have small New York City living rooms. So these restaurants become extensions of that. Alexander. Well, just to piggyback a little bit on what Nicole said, you know, when you go to a restaurant, um, so much of that experience happens in the first five minutes. You know, uh, when you approach the host station, you know, that entrance, that welcome, uh, how you're received, uh, and essentially how you are made to feel. Um, restaurants uh, are, are about becoming your living room, your, your safe and nurturing place outside of your home. You come there, and oftentimes in certain homes, restaurants have become what is no longer available at home, which is you know, a celebratory meal or a meal with close friends and family that may not be happening at home because of schedules that are going all over the place. When I go to a restaurant, for my personal experience, I wanna feel not only welcomed, but embraced, uh, taken care of and made to feel that whatever my needs are, um, obviously within reason, that they're there to support that experience. Um, my favorite restaurant is not necessarily the restaurant that has the best food, but, the, but it makes me feel the best. It, it, take, it sits me down, it takes care of me. Um, my favorite restaurants is the ones that let me order off the menu. <laughs> you know, um, I have a couple of uh, restaurants that I go to in my neighborhood, and you know, I know the menu by heart. I didn't come there uh, because I wanted a particular item on the menu. I came there because I wanted to feel a certain way. And uh, so I met my favorite Italian restaurant, and they don't have chicken fricassee on the menu, or, 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 or franchise, sorry. And so, you know, I lived in Rome for many years when, when I was a young opera singer, and that's the favorite dish. They go in the kitchen, they make it. So, essentially, how you make me feel as a restaurant is what I take with me, and is why I come back uh, again and again and again. Um, and that would be my best experience. That would be the experience that I long for at any place I went welcomed, taken care of, and going the extra distance to make me feel like this is my place too. Um, yeah, I think it's about feeling seen. I went to Canlis restaurant in Seattle. I don't know how many of you know the restaurant Canlis in Seattle, but <clears throat> I think it's one of the great dining rooms in America. And I was there and they knew that I was in Seattle for one night and I chose to go there. And they also knew that I loved a few other places in Seattle. One of which is the burger place Dick's, which I just think is amazing, and another place is Din Tai Fung, the dumpling place. There's an outpost there. And so two of the courses I had during my meal, they went and they got food from Din Tai Fung, and they got food from Dick's, and they're like, hey, we're so honored that you came here on your one night, and we don't want you to miss out on the other things that we know you love. And I thought that was exceptional. Yeah. Now, granted, no. this would happen for any anyone here. <laughs> By the way, Just if you go to Canlis and say Will said I could have a Dick's burger, <laughs> I guarantee you, even if it's someone watching at home, they will give you a Dick's burger. <laughs> Just say it when you walk in the door, so they have a minute to put it together. But I also think uh, 
when you're having a tasting menu or when you're having a lot of food, even just someone that sees that like halfway through you're no longer finishing the food and they just come up and say, hey, looks like you're filling up. Do you want all the rest of the courses? I just think any time that anyone is present enough when they're serving you to actually kind of see where you're at and understand what you're communicating, even if you don't have the ability to articulate it out loud or even the confidence to do so, and they're there to meet you. I think that's what great hospitality means. I'd like to add that <clears throat> I can see this in one experience after 9-11. And we had Maharlika and we had, um, uh, not 9-11, sorry. I can see in the restaurant industry that uh, in New York City, during times of disaster, people will still go out to eat. So uh, during 9-11, people would still be out at restaurants because they feel the connection to the servers, they feel the connection to the family that they have extended outside in, these restaurant in this restaurant industry. I saw that at Jeepney when we opened during Hurricane, um, or uh, what was it called, guys? The Sandy. 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 And in the East Village, the water had rose to knee high. A lot of restaurants had closed. Fortunately, for whatever reason, Maharlika and Jeepney was still in operation. And Jeepney was like dead. No one was going there for the first five months. It was like awful. But people would still go to Maharlika because they felt the connection. And I think that's only a product of the hospitality that they felt. Yeah. Nicole, I, I corresponded a bit with all three of these um, fine people before the panel. And one of the things you said to me in an email yes. um, was that you feel that your early experiences working in retail oh. were uniquely good preparation for working in restaurants. And you specifically mentioned lessons you took from The Gap yes. and from Nordstrom. Yes, sir. <laughs> Talk, talk about how working for The Gap made you a great restaurateur. Well, it's so true. You know, where I grew up in San Diego, I think in high school you have the choice of going into retail or restaurants, and the culinary highlight in Rancho Bernardo was Shakey's Pizza. So I wasn't going into restaurants, and I chose The Gap and Nordstrom. And I, I remember the training at The Gap and how we would approach customers. You know, they have an acronym called GAP Act, greeting, approach, product knowledge, uh, <laughs> access her eyes closed and thank you. So that's what it was. I love Mickey Drexler. He was an awesome CEO of The Gap and I still carry that over in how I train my staff and we applied our own acronym. It was ALARM, you know, so it was observe, listen, ask with open-ended questions, respond, and then manage it. You don't need to look for me, you don't look to anyone else. You have your own real estate, you have your own customer. Use that acronym to guide you in your own way. And at North, <laughs> it was so awesome because you know we learned this old folklore that you could return even a tire. I don't know if anyone worked at Nordstrom, and there was an old story of a woman had rolled a tire into the store, and they accepted it. And, <laughs> and so that, that was embedded into me. Absurd, right? <laughs> okay. It was embedded into me the idea of trust with a, with a, a salesperson, a store, a company, creating a persona, personifying um, connection. And so, you know, when people come into my restaurant, I'm often times I get the opportunity to introduce dishes that they've never had before. And people can get really scared with new food. So I need to make them feel that they can come and try something and they can return it if they don't like it. That they can talk to me and say, Ay, Yoko, naman, I don't like this. Okay, fine. No problem po. I can return it. What else would you like? Or if it's, you know, Frank, you didn't like it? That's cool. What, what, what would you like today? But I want maybe, you to come maybe back. Maybe a tire, right? <laughs> it's a tire. But the point is, is that I need you to come back. I need you to feel that you can trust me and that if you don't like anything, it's no big deal. I think the hardest part, though, when dealing with young staff in particular is that they don't know that they're empowered to do that. They think, oh, the $20 for the dish, we can't give back that $20. But the food cost or the, the cost of losing them doesn't, doesn't even equal the cost of the, the trust that they will come back over many, 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 many times. Alexander, you made reference earlier 
rather humbly to being an opera singer. But in fact, <laughs> but in fact, <laughs> I was like, wow, that came out early uh, in the panel, huh? <laughs> yeah. there'll, there'll, there'll be no demonstration. <laughs> no, no, no. Correct me if I'm wrong, I believe you have both an Emmy and a Grammy to your credit? A Grammy and a Tony. Grammy and Tony, okay. Ah. Working on the Emmy. Whoa. Ah. Just, just the Emmy. We got, we got to egot you. You got to do the whole, know. you know. Um, I, no, I'm, I'm genuinely curious. How does being a musician inform your work as a restaurateur? How does being an opera singer, in particular, show up and get reflected in your restaurant work? Well, I see myself first and foremost as an artist, uh, an artist whose canvas is music. Uh, I started off by playing piano and then, uh, then singing, and, uh, and then I set off on a career uh, as an opera singer. Um, uh, very fortunate to have traveled throughout the country and Europe and the Far East singing uh, before uh, exchanging that stage for the hospitality restaurant stage. So um, I think that my my palette, if you will, is one of a person who is uh, artistic, and I approach music and food in in that way. When I decided to essentially, um, in the early '90s, change arenas, change stages, I went from the opera stage to the restaurant stage. Uh, it was also because I had a long history cooking and hosting in New York, giving salons and parties. Um, uh, friends of mine, because people wanted my party at their house, uh, essentially uh, had cards made up for me. And, uh, and between singing engagements, I was doing people's parties and I loved it. It was just, Nothing was more satisfying uh, to me than singing, than throwing parties and, 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 and creating an ambiance that was special. And, and so I took that sort of artist, artistic expression, eye for detail, um, uh, lyricism, uh, and ensemble work into the hospitality arena, into the restaurant arena. My, ideas uh, about food mirrored the, the travels that, uh, that as a young opera singer took me all over the world. And what I realized, because again, I was dealing with an, a palette of my food that I grew up with, that I could take those recipes and those ingredients and I could give them new life and create a new canvas for them. Uh, when I understood the, the, what I consider the difference between cooking and, and fine dining uh, was to curate um, a flavor profile uh, and an experience that allowed people to um, engage on every level from flavors to textures. Uh, and I think I did that because I had a creative artistic background. And so that, that it informed music for me, and then it informed culinary. Yeah. Will you have um, written a bit in various places about your thoughts on hospitality? And I think it was something you wrote for Fast Company about your time early on at Tribeca Grill. And you were doing a lot of the adding up of figures at the end of the night, and you noticed which servers were getting the far better tips, and you came to some conclusions about how they differed in their performance with others. I'm smiling guess... because Frank Bruni read an article that I wrote. <laughs> and I'm just feeling really good about it. I emailed him a link to the article. It wasn't attached. Full disclosure. Wasn't attached. <laughs> but, but he read it, which is big for me. <laughs> um. But that other attachment to I know. I was um, no. <laughs> But could you, could you talk about that? It was really interesting. Thank you. Uh, yeah, one of my first internships was at Tribeca Grill back in the day. I was, I was going to school and my summer internship was there. And my job was management intern, which meant I had virtually uh, no real responsibility outside of teaching the managers how to use Excel, um, <laughs> which now my interns teach me because <laughs> Excel seems to change every few years. Um, 
And then a bunch of servers either left or were fired, and I was, I was made a server on the floor, which was kind of a dream come true, especially this was uh, 1999. Tribeca Grill was like everything at that point. And so I did what I think most people do when they want to excel. They try to figure out who is the best at what they're doing, and they try to emulate those people. Um, and there was a group of servers there, and they were like ninjas. They, when they were at this table, they knew that that table needed dessert, that one needed to get water, that one was waiting on check, that one needed to be me as before entree. And they had this Keanu Reeves in the Matrix-like ability to figure out like what needed to be done when so that it would be the most efficient dining experience possible. And I got pretty good at it. But uh, to Frank's point, at the end, in any restaurant, you fill out your tip sheet, and you see who's bringing in the most tips. So you'll see number of tips, number of covers. Um, and those people weren't making the most tips. There was another group that was serving less people and making more money. Mm. Um, and so I started studying them because I was kind of confused. This other group, their, their superpower, and I say superpower a lot because I think it's important in work to know what your own superpower is and lean into that. Their superpower was that when they were at a table, they didn't care about anyone else in the dining room. They were so focused on the people that they were serving that they created experiences that were much, much more memorable for those people. Now, granted, the turn times were longer. They didn't serve as many people. Maybe you didn't have a fork when your entree came. But people felt loved, they felt seen, they felt a true sense of belonging in the restaurant. Um, and that's why they made more money than the other ones. If I remember correctly, you also observed, and I may be getting this wrong, seriously, you also observed something else that I was fascinated by, which was they were not the chatterers. Isn't that right? The, the, wa the waiters, you're talking about the ones who were getting... Yeah, they didn't need to necessarily be over there chatting. It was just like, we talk about being present, I think, in this day and age. Being present it's, it's like a platitude. It's overused a lot. For me, being present just means caring so much about the thing that you're doing that you stop caring about everything else. Um, and it doesn't mean you need to talk a lot. It need, like, honestly, sometimes talking a lot is just annoying. <laughs> Everyone's been in a restaurant where the server just won't shut up. <laughs> it's just about like, when the server's there, you know that they're not trying to run away from you. And that feels good. You are all, I mean, you've been in this for, for years. You've all been restaurateurs during a period of incredibly swift and extensive technological changes. I mean, in terms of the implements people bring to the table, in terms of the way people make reservations, all sorts of things. How is technology making it easier to provide great hospitality, and how is it proving to be a great obstacle? Any one of you. I mean, just from uh, operations and systems, it's uh, cleaner ordering, um, maintaining tickets, understanding timing, um, certainly being able to um, audit and monitor sales away from the restaurant because before it used to be you only could access the POS data, point of sale data, when you were in the restaurant. Now with the technology, I could be um, in Aruba, I could be anywhere, and I could see what Topher served, who's, you know, and with the cameras I can monitor the restaurant. So that, that opens things up, I, I would say, as a restaurant owner, have better balance of life and to um, tighten systems. But what I fear is the advent of more technology for front of house so that we stop interacting with each other, so that you order at McDonald's or you order the sushi and you don't really need to interact with anyone. No, this isn't anything new. We had automats in the 50s. People just put the nickel and get the, get the food before. But it's, it's really one of the last moments where we can share with one another, where we can have a conversation, where we can, hey, Sam, how's, how, you know, how's your day? And I'm, I'm fearful how that creeps into the beauty of hospitality. But I think it's a little bit how it, like, I, I always used to hate technology in restaurants because I felt it interrupted the human connection. And we, we literally would put all those screens behind a wall so that you wouldn't see the glow of a computer screen when you're in the dining room. Um, and I hated the idea of an online reservation because I was like, no, I want to talk to them on the phone. And then one time, uh, I think it was my aunt, she was like, I tried to make a reservation at your restaurant and it was the most annoying thing possible. <laughs> I was like, go on. She's like, I called and I waited on hold for a half an hour and then they said that they were full. And I was like, yeah, I guess that actually is the experience. And then Uber came out. 
And then I realized, you know, back in the day when the Uber driver would show up, they'd always call you right when they got downstairs, and it was the most annoying thing in the world because this technology was designed so you no longer had to talk to people. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I think I started to realize, like, when I'm in an airport in a foreign country where I don't speak the language and they have one of those screens such okay. that I can order, I'm so comforted by the fact that I don't need to... But don't you want the discomfort when you travel to, to a little bit of that, to be like, I need help and to... There's to... plenty of discomfort. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying all you restaurants, I mean. like all restaurants you know... are not created equally. And I think that there's some where I want as much human connection as possible. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that every restaurant experience or every food experience, rather, should have... Uh, the same amount of human interaction. Okay. I think it just needs to be, it's like with great power comes great responsibility. Oh. I, think, I think the key is when, who monitors it and is it stopped? But you are, if I can add to that, because I, I, I would say more or less the same. I just think that um, uh, these things are, uh, should be used in a way that it makes our job easier to spend more time with you and give you the best experience that you could possibly have. Ultimately, um, the, the, the benefits to us um, affect you um, uh, sort of in a behind the scenes way. Um, when you come to the restaurant, you want our attention and th nothing should get in the way or interfere with that. Um, and to w Will's point, um, it is up to the restaurant, the restaurateur, uh, the, uh, the, the, the philosophy to make sure that the expertise that we are experiencing from the automations and the systems doesn't become a part of your experience. And if we do that, I, I think it's a win-win. I agree with you. I was at an Olive Garden a few weeks ago. <laughs> Don't ask. <laughs> You're there for the bread. Oh yeah, Come I want to know. And on the table was like a, 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 a literal game console. Which was basically like, don't talk to the people you're dining with, just play like Angry Birds or something. I think that's, I think when it starts to cross over into meals where you're being served and cared for over a long period of time and where like the presence of technology results in the absence of human connection, I agree that that is a scary thing because restaurants are one of the last places where we can create magical worlds where people can genuinely connect. Let me add something to that point. For example, the end of the evening, because of technology, it is possible that people could exit without us saying a word to them. Once we drop the bill, uh, you know, you do whatever you do, um, pay the bill with an app or this or that, and the experience is done. There's something about having the personal touch of the restaurateur, the, the, the server, to help close out that evening. Thank you and, and wish you, wish you uh, a well and please return and see us again. And this is where technology, I think, would cross the line if we took that away. If we didn't essentially be there for every moment that you experience in, uh, in your time with us. I think it's a key. I mean, this obviously, for me, bookends a conversation between technology and the workforce, the incoming workforce. And do they know how to have the soft skills because they've been down here all this time? <laughs> or they have conversations and they can scheme and text or think, you know, they can take their time to respond versus in the moment, responding with heart, responding with mind. And uh, it is a conundrum. So are, are, you finding that, are you finding that your younger staffers sometimes lack those people skills? <laughs> Was that a rhetorical question <laughs> I just asked? It, I mean, it's, it's more rampant. For, for me, I can't speak for them, but certainly for me, it's more rampant. And the, the, the understanding of urgency, there's no urgency. <laughs> I mean, who else? Okay. Can you, can, so. you, <laughs> can you say urgency one more time? I just love it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's, um, it's proven to be a challenge, but it is incumbent on us to, to figure out how to maneuver that a la Gap Act. Or, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Speaking of technology, there's been a lot written about the disruption of the movie business by you know, streaming services, by Netflix, Amazon Prime, et cetera. And movie theaters are reinventing themselves to give 
theater to give movie watchers a more compelling reason to leave home. It strikes me that in an analogous way, we now have Uber Eats, we have caviar, so we can get more and better food mm -hmm. delivered to our homes, especially in a city like New York, than ever before. Are, is the restaurant industry going to be threatened by that somewhat? Is it gonna to have to remake itself a little bit to make going out for that food a more compelling experience? I think it's just great job security for the hospitality guys. Mm -hmm. I mean that, like, you can get good food without leaving your apartment. Going to a restaurant is not just about great food. Or going to a great restaurant is not just about getting great food. And I think we went through a season where it was such a chef-centric industry that it was almost as if, like, you were celebrating moments where you weren't cared for, where the chairs weren't comfortable, where you couldn't make a reservation, where they didn't care if you didn't like an ingredient. Um, I think it's an opportunity. I think it gives us the ability just to try harder to be nice. I so agree with that. Absolutely. Thanks, man. <laughs> <laughs> hey. <laughs> As restaurateurs, which holiday do you hate the most? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Valentine's Day. <laughs> <laughs> Valentine's Day. Oh my God. <laughs> I mean, it's great. The restaurant will be packed, but sometimes people break up on Valentine's Day. <laughs> In the restaurant. <laughs> It oh has my. happened. It has oh happened. My. <laughs> it has happened. And then, of course, there's wonderful love stories people have proposed. I, you know, that's great. And, um, but Valentine's Day can be a real kicker. SantaCon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even kidding. The Nomad Bar, we literally will close on SantaCon. But then there's that group of just, uh, who are like, wouldn't it be cool to go to 11 Madison Park <laughs> on SantaCon? Uh, I just think the worst people in the world become far worse. <laughs> On SantaCon. <laughs> so. Oh, I have to have one. Yeah. <laughs> well, Valentine's is taken. <laughs> um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure that I've always known what to do on St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> For some reason. <laughs> I think that's probably caused more, more angst than not. Uh, <laughs> I'll leave it at that. <laughs> okay, from light to a little bit more serious, I want to ask a Me Too question. Mm. So back when I was the restaurant critic, uh, and it was a more innocent era, I think, one of the ways I would always know I was recognized in a restaurant is that frequently whichever server I had until that moment was replaced by the most attractive young male server they had in-house. <laughs> and that person was often flirty, which was fine. Flirty is a more loaded thing, thing these days. Do you talk to your servers about certain lines that need to be observed and certain sorts of issues related to how they interact with diners on that front? I'm just trying to remember if I ever did that to you when you were in one of the restaurants. <laughs> hmm. No, you didn't have to because you were there. Thank you. <laughs> Does that end the article? <laughs> I don't, I mean, I feel like maybe we run different types of restaurants. I, I, I think one of the things we talk about all the time is that we try to create environments where the moment any one of the staff, male or female, feels uncomfortable based on whatever energy they're receiving from the guests, that they feel comfortable and they feel an invitation um, to get the management team involved. That uh, receiving an energy that you're not comfortable with is not a sign of failure. Um, it just means that something's not going the way it's supposed to go. So that we can get involved and either change servers or sometimes the guest is just acting exceptionally inappropriate and they need to be asked to leave. And that's the only way I really know how to answer that is just, I think it's creating a culture where people feel comfortable like raising a flag, that things aren't going the way that they need them to go, that they don't feel comfortable. And I think that's the biggest thing 
when you talk about Me Too or really like all of the HR related things or culturally uh, driven things in the restaurant business right now, is just giving people comforts to say, I'm not comfortable. Um, and creating an environment where they don't feel like it backfires on them when they do. I have been in experiences where I could raise my hand and say, me too. Mm, I can recall little insidious moments, you know, like printing a daily menu and the printer will be clogged. You open the printer drawer and then there's a stack of porn photos that have been replaced by the paper. And, you know, you're like, shit. You know, you're in that moment. You, they know that you're the one printing that menu. There's no one printing that menu but you that day. And I didn't say anything. I threw it away. I put the paper back in, printed the menu, touched up the mascara that had run, put the lipstick on, and I was like, hey, chef, here's your menus for the day. At that time, I didn't feel that I had anyone to talk to or that anyone would consider it serious enough to either let someone go, warn, or just hear me out. What has happened in the last couple of years has allowed that experience to have reached the light of day so that would have never happened ever again or even possibly happened to begin with because now we are, we're all so more, much more conscious of it. Your question was, how do I deal with it in the restaurant? Um, I, we nip it in the bud. I mean, you, you, I've had experiences where someone has made a pass at someone, you know. I had a, a mail server and a manager, he was opening the safe and just really inappropriate, really inappropriate. And uh, it was a no, no tolerance. So we had to, that couldn't happen anymore. But by and large, in, in my staff, we are, we're, We've mostly talked about how to raise, raise the standard, raise our integrity, even how we talk to guests. Like, um, I, I tell my staff, you know, you are no different just because you're a server. You have a seat, explain the, explain the specials with them. So when they look at me, we are looking eye to eye. There's no, there's no levels, even physically. So, um, I hope I'm answering it in some way. My own experience, what I think has changed in this industry and what I do in my own business is that um, dialogue, setting an example of no tolerance for that, and um, raising the bar of what the expectation is. I wanna, um, let's switch to something lighter. I wanna ask two lighter questions and then we're gonna take it to the audience so you all can ask some questions. For starters, what is the most absurd customer request each of you has received? <laughs> in your restaurant and how did you handle it? Wow, okay. Alexander, do you want to go first? Me? Oh, hmm. Oh, okay, um, let me talk about <laughs> an absurd situation that I had to respond to, uh, somewhat of a request. Uh, I had a customer and my, my first restaurant had been opened a few months and um, you know, we were, we were doing very well, got some wonderful write-ups from the New York Times, and, um, and uh, uh, place was buzzing, packed, etc. cetera. Uh, so it was a Sunday, and someone who had been there on a Saturday night came in the door and said, oh, I have a, a complaint. It was doing service, and I said, well, you know, sir, how, how can I help you? And he said, well, look what's in this bag. He had a, had a Cafe Beulah bag where apparently he had taken home his dessert or something like that. And I opened the bag and I didn't really say anything. It was like a, an, almost an empty bag. And I, I, I so what is, what is the point? What, what, how can I assist you? He said, you don't see what's in there? I said, uh, I don't, uh, it's an empty bag. He said, well, let me just show you. So he takes the bag, puts it on the counter, there are two dead roaches in the bag. What? He said. Two uh, dead roaches. Yes, roaches, bugs. <laughs> so he said, um, I want a refund because I got home and they, uh, these roaches were in this bag and I, I, um, I want my money back. Uh, 
I said, for the whole meal. He said, no, for the dessert. I said, well, where's the dessert? He said, well, I ate it. So I said, I said, I have no words for this. <laughs> and how do I know those are my roaches? <laughs> so, you know, I just said, it would be my pleasure to buy you dessert. Uh, so sorry. He said, thank you. I gave him, I think it was 10 bucks. And he said, I'd like to make reservations for next week. <laughs> That was a trying moment. <laughs> Maybe I didn't ask you a question, but it was a good No, no, you did, exactly. <laughs> um, oh, can, you t can you top the dead roaches? I don't know if I could top that story, but uh, mine is discounts. And you would not ask me for a discount. You would not ask me for a discount. But for mm, a certain group of people who, who might understand this, when you have in my experience, a brown-owned restaurant, and you have, sometimes you're, you are serving your own, is the idea that you would ask for a discount. And what grounds do they give you for the question? Kababayan! <laughs> we're together, we're, you know, we're countrymen. Home girl. <laughs> yeah, I'm a home girl, give me a discount. No, see, the absurdity that is on your face right now, I wish I could, we get a photo of this. <laughs> Because you would not, you, because honestly, it seems absurd. I would not go to your restaurant and ask for a discount. But it's, it's very common. So that is the absurd. But you did have a senior citizen discount, didn't you? I have a, I have a military, at a military discount, and a nurse discount. So for the I'm a nurse. <laughs> so there's a lot of Filipino yeah. nurses just. <laughs> <laughs> um, you give us your answer. In the meantime, we're going to go right after your answer because we're running out of time to audience questions. So if the microphones can come out and people can start lining up, that'd be great. No, I mean, I love the, the weird requests are sometimes the most fun because we try to figure out whether we can make it happen. I think some of them are just impossible. Like, I'd like a vegetarian menu, and this is like December, and I don't eat root vegetables. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, all right, here we go. And, but even then, we still like to make it happen. But I, I was actually just out in Chicago, uh, and I was talking to some friends of mine who work at Alinea, and there was a great story there with this guy at Alinea back in the day, they had two menus, a 16 course and a 32 course, taste and the tour. And the guy signed up for the tour. And he gets there, and they're like, sir, we're gonna begin your menu. And he's like, I'm gonna stop you right there. I'd like a steak. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, sir, chef actually has a 32 course menu prepared for you. He's like, I don't want a single one of those courses. I just want a steak. So the server goes back to the kitchen and says to Grant, like, uh, dude, and he's like, yeah, we're gonna make a mistake. And he sends someone out to like, I don't know where you can get like a big copper roasting pan and just does, I mean, he, Grant worked at the French Laundry. He knows how to cook an amazing steak. And so they bring him out a porterhouse for two and the guy just tucks into it and demolishes the steak and he goes, son? And the server goes over, he goes, that was the best damn steak I have ever had in my life. Now bring me all 32 of those courses. <laughs> yes. Um, and I just wow. love that so much, so. That's great. We're gonna start over here. Hi, I wanna thank you guys for being here. Um, I'm very impressed at how funny you guys are. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you should do a TV show, I help produce it. <laughs> but um, the question that I have is, um, I created a festival, it's a music festival in the summertime, it's in Sweden, and um, it's on its fifth year, and I, I wanna add like more food stuff next year. Uh, so uh, my question is, um, other than partnering up, um, you know, uh, what suggestions do you have? What advice do you have about like adding food or like what kind of food works? Hire a food manager. Okay. To help manage the vendors and their needs. Um, uh, sometimes I've been a part of those kind of festivals and they don't have an experienced food manager. So you're, you're dealing with a lot of restaurants that need a point person to help run that. So that would be, I would start with that. 
That's very helpful, thank you. I would add that you need to define the food aspect that you want to be a part of your, your festival. Um, is right now your festival is a predominantly a mu music festival, right? Yes. So what kind of music? What kind of music oh, is it? It's hip hop, soul, R&B, um, pop, little rock, reggae, it's everything. Oh, it's everything. All genres, yeah. Um, so a, a smorgasbord, you know, you, you could go from country western all the way, you know, to uh, what, what is typically soul food. But to Nicole's point, uh, the one thing that you want to do is not run the food part of your food <laughs> festival. Yeah. Exactly. You want to get a coordinator who coordinates all of those various vendors, because I'm assuming the food will mirror the kind of music you're doing, and uh, essentially allow them. I suggest food trucks, a whole oh. lot of them, oh. and just put them out there. Where is the festival? <laughs> What, what, Where's the festival? It's in Sweden, in Gothenburg, Sweden. Nice place. Yeah. That's nice. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we link up after. <laughs> Let's go over here. I'm going to go back and forth quickly so we get all of you in and, and maybe just one person each answer the question. Go ahead. Well, this one's for Will. Hi, Will. It's Teresa Siriani. Uh, hi. You? Nice to see hi. you. It's great to see you. So are you ready to tell us where Will is going next? Vacation. <laughs> <laughs> where are you going? Uh, no, I'm, I'm not ready to say what I'm doing next, but I, I am going to take a, about like a solid month um, awesome. completely disconnected. Do you, this is one of my last days in New York before I take off for a while. Wow. So. Wow. Yeah. Bon voyage. Thank you so much. <laughs> Sir? Why is it that at some restaurants there's still a lot of attitude and pretension when you walk in the front door? Is that ego that's coming from the restaurant? Is it a perception of the needs of the guests? Is it cultural? What are your thoughts? Which one do you want to are you? You're leaning forward, Will. Do you want to take that? Oh, I, I, that was just my Oh, that's question. a Will question, for sure. Um, I just think it, I think, what, what is it, the old adage, like a, a fish stinks from the head or something? Mm -hmm. Like, it just means whoever's running the restaurant doesn't care enough to inspire their team to do better, I think. I think there's a set of values that exist at any restaurant, and, um, and if there is attitude that's that prevalent, it means that like, just being humbly gracious and profoundly hospitable is not one of those values. And by the way, there are some people that love going to that restaurant. <laughs> um, but I think it's just about deciding what's important to you and, and choosing to spend your money accordingly. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Vanessa. My question is for Nicole. Um, I'm a huge fan of your cookbook, I'm a Filipino. And one of the reasons why I, I loved it so much is because it doesn't just talk about food um, and, and recipes kind of more, um, I don't know, it's, it's not just direction on how to recreate a, a dish. It, uh, it has it in conversation with history and culture and stories. Mm -hmm. And I guess I wanted to understand um, what inspired you to um, talk about your Filipino food as it relates to the history of the Philippines and, and colonization. Like, What inspired you to take that lens to your cookbook? Uh, well, in the fifth grade social studies, uh, I had a you know, Europe textbook, and I think we finally went over the Spanish-American War, and it was a chapter, and I remember seeing Philippines, and I just kept reading, rereading that sentence, Philippines, Philippines. I only can look in hindsight that I realized I was so proud to see it written in a textbook, that I existed, that that was my parents' culture. I mean. That's how important representation can be. As oh, what is fifth grade, 11 years old? I felt so much pride. Or when I watch, would watch Fame and see Irene Cara. She's not even Filipino, but she was brown, my God. I was like, I'm gonna live forever, it's Fame. <laughs> <laughs> and so when I went on this journey to do the restaurant and, and the book, it was, who is the 11-year-old, who's the 21-year-old, who's the person in Manila, who's the person in Dubai or Detroit, that they need to read about themselves, and for those who are not Filipino, that you could learn about us. So it was unpacking, oh, we're not necessarily just Spanish, we're, we're lots Mexican, and Moro, and Mele, and The Matrix. So I wrote for my 11-year-old self, yeah. That's cool. 
Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Hey guys, uh, thank you for speaking and thank you everyone for coming. Uh, I just started as a floor manager in one of New York's busiest restaurants, uh, Catch NYC, if anyone wants to come. Um, so more specifically for Will, we do have a lot of servers who spend their time at the service station talking about guests or just generally feeling the overwhelmingness. How do you inspire your staff to then have that energy, more so than just for monetary purposes and to really bring that vibe to the restaurant? How do you inspire them to not speak negatively about the guest, or how do you? Just to be there with the energy, you know, solely for the purpose of caring about the guest, and to be there happily and, and with joy. We have this thing we, we say all the time, uh, it's one of our cultural kind of principles, it's cool to care. Um, I think at the end of the day, there's a piece of us that will always be our high school selves. I, I really do, I think that's what motivates people to, speak negatively about people. It's like cool to talk shit a little bit. I think in high school, the people that were the most apathetic were somehow celebrated as being the cool kids and the ones that tried the hardest were invariably called nerds. Um, and I think that if you can be an inspiring enough leader where you celebrate the people that do well and you create a culture where like affirmation is given to the people that give like their best selves to the table every single night. I think that kind of thing, A, it becomes uh, like a virus in a good way where it starts to spread. And I think that people genuinely, whether they're willing to admit it or not, want to be a part of an environment and a group of people that actually care. Um, it's just really hard to get there and it takes showing up every single day and you know, getting in front of the team and like talking about caring, which by the way, um, is not necessarily seen as cool in the first place. Mm -hmm. But once it takes root, it's just amazing what can happen next. Thank you. We'll go back over here. I apologize for even saying this, but I, they're gonna start giving me this soon. So if you could keep, we'll get to the five of you, you can keep the questions short and the answer short, and we'll just kind of lightning round it. I'm sorry, thank you. Okay. Um, so I was just wondering, in this era where kind of everyone may consider themselves to be a restaurant critic through Instagram or Yelp or whatever internet source. Has that presented um, a different way that you look at hospitality or a new challenge in your restaurants? It could be for anyone. Alexandra, why don't you take this one? If I understood you correct, um, you are asking how do we um, sort of combat this culture of everyone being a food critic, everyone having an opinion. Uh, well, I mean, we've created this culture, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, I mean, it, it can be extremely difficult on a lot of the social media platforms. Um, I won't name any of them. Uh, that wouldn't be fair to, to us. But, but who essentially take, uh, who give uh, a platform to a lot of that, and often, um, people are able to be very critical uh, and not be forthcoming. In other words, you don't have to really identify yourself. Um, but I think that it really, you have to keep doing what is your mission. And you have to essentially work hard to make sure that what uh, your intentions are, um, what your product is, your best self, gets out there above and beyond all of that. Everybody's not doing that. Just some people are doing it. You know, just like the question earlier about uh, the attitude in restaurants and, and uh, why being so um, uh, uptight and stuff being condescending. You know, and some people like that and some people don't. So uh, essentially, the restaurant tour's job is to just simply make sure that they bring the best product they can every night. And those people are going to exist. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, my question's for Will. Uh, my wife and I got married at the Nomad in 2016 on the roof, and we came back to the restaurant the following year for our anniversary, and at the end of our meal, we were uh, provided like a photograph, or it was a painting of a photograph uh, from our wedding day. And it was like this amazing experience, and I was wondering like, what is your process for creating experiences like that, and how do you instill that level of care in your team? I didn't know which direction you were going. <laughs> I was like, oh shit. Um, I think it, it dovetails off the answer before. Um, I mean, we, we have positions at the restaurants called Dreamweavers. Um, 
And there are people whose sole job is to create memories like that for people. Um, and they don't necessarily need to come up with all the ideas. Anyone can come up with them, but they're the ones that execute them. And we hire them from Parsons or FIT. Or um, Here's the thing. When you, around the holidays, there's people who like to give gifts, and there's those that like to receive them. I believe that both people are just as selfish. Um, <laughs> I like to give gifts, but if I were to give a gift to you, and it was a good gift, and the look on your face when you get it, I'm like, yes, I crushed it. <laughs> Whoever came up with that for you, I don't know who it was. I guarantee you they were celebrated in front of the rest of the team for having come up with the idea, which that on its own is addictive, being celebrated in front of your peers. Mm. But they were also probably creeping in the corner of the room when, they, when you received it, <laughs> just because they wanted to see the look. Because that, you talk about what do you need to do to fill your gas tanks that you can keep on pushing. That look probably filled their gas tank for a month. Um, Thanks for getting married at the moment. <laughs> Hi, uh, for Will. Uh, so I, I run a small uh, dessert business in, on Silver Street. And um, now I'm trying to focus more on service, but my challenge is how to do the like, memorable service in a quicker, like, shorter service. Uh, how do you translate that experience in a more fast-paced um, service? Um, I think there's the, the two things. Okay, what he got, like the, the illustrated version of the photo, that's, an, that's a little intense. <laughs> uh, but we also have like a toolbox, uh, we call it a toolbox, of like very, very quick, easy things that we do in advance. And let's say you turn over the plate, we see you turn over the plate, we'll give you a card that says where to buy the plates. Or let's say you're a tourist, you're in town, you're asking what are the restaurant to go to. We already have cards that say some of our favorite restaurants. Um, let's say you're, we see that you have a cigar, we like have a little map, we show you where to go smoke the cigar, or whatever it is. Like, you can come up with cool stuff and you do it in advance, and I bet there's ideas that you could come up with pretty easily, and it's almost like your mise en place. If you have it there, then you can just go. But I think the other thing is just like what I said before about being present. I think eye contact and a little bit of patience in a fast-moving environment is the most profound hospitality you can give. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we're over time, but if you guys can be really quick, we'll do these last two. Okay, hi. Uh, so I'm actually a hospitality major in college, and I was wondering, when you're managing so, so many employees and they're all very different, how do you work to both manage all of the different personalities at once and also how do you both be their friend and earn their trust so that they feel like you're approachable, but also for when, if they make a mistake, you have to give them constructive criticism and just how do you balance all that? Nicole. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for that question. It's a very thoughtful question. Um, trying to provide a thoughtful answer, and I'm, I'm still trying to figure that out, uh, managing the different personalities. Um, the environment, I think, is what's most important, and the people that they work with and work for. Uh, restaurants, as you know, can be very hot uh, and intense and egos and things can fly in the moment. So most importantly, I think, is that they know at the end of the shift, we can hash things out and find the solution to whatever went wrong. Or, but in the moment, it's just to keep the flow. Yeah. Thank you. You're By the book, The One Minute Manager. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The book, The One Minute Manager, it's this thick, and I think it's one of the greatest management books ever. Mm -hmm. It's such a pleasure to hear from all of you. You've been, it's been really great to listen to you. Uh, this question is for Alexander. Um, you switched from an, such an amazing career into a, an industry which I think is very difficult. Um, what is it that I'd be interested in, to hear in what is something that you found so rewarding that kept you going, something related to hospitality that you've just, just made me think, yes, I wanna keep going at this and you know, continue in this field? Well, it's simple, really. It was a passion. 
just an, uh, an absolute passion. I grew up uh, in a household where food uh, was everything. It was power, and the person who made the food had all the power. Um, <laughs> And I like that. <laughs> I like that a lot. <laughs> um, but, it, but again, a, a passion to also, um, it, it was very important for me to uh, be somewhat of a culinary activist, bringing the food of the um, African diaspora and the um, African American heritage into its full um, expression and have it recognized for the uh, high level of, uh, of culinary that it is. Uh, so all of these things drive me forward and, um, and there you have it, fashion. Do you have a favorite? From a, a favorite what? A favorite from all the foods in the African diaspora. A favorite food? Yeah. Well, you know, I wrote a book called, called Between Harlem and Heaven, which is the culinary conversation of uh, the food of the, um, uh, the uh, African diaspora on five continents. Essentially, I followed the African uh, slave trail and, and came up with my version of what uh, that would look like if it were a cuisine. In other words, you want the answer? It. Buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> the secrets of the <laughs> Okay, speaking of, speaking of books, Alexandra and Nicole will be signing books downstairs. Thank the three of you so much Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you.